been looking back along this winding road to the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known. And oh, it may sound simple, but it's more than a question. There's no other way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. Now I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been good. Times are playing and I can see cried some bitter tears but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears I've had more gains than losses no more joy than hurt as his grace rolled down upon me undeserved God's been good in my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. Though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. For through it all, God's been good. God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning. His love will be my end. I could spend forever trying to tell you everything he is. But the best way I can say it is this. God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night Though I've had my share of hard times Wouldn't change them if I could For through it all God's been Last Sunday night of 2019, can you believe it? I can't. Time flies. I tell you what, it's just amazing. That's the reminiscing over all the year, thanking God for all his blessings. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'd like to uh, preach a message on looking back on 2019 or a view from the end zone. You know, Paul's about to die, about to give his life. I imagine he's looking out over the... Uh, courtyard or the jailhouse yard at the very chopping block that they're about to chop his head off and he pins these words to young Timothy as an older soldier to a younger soldier and gives him a command because he says I charge thee therefore before God and so this message will not be for wimps but it'll be for soldiers and we're all soldiers one of the greatest mistakes you can ever make is to think that this Christian life is all tiptoeing through the tulips. It's more like tiptoeing through the minefield. It's a warfare. And uh, we don't know where the, where the bombs are. We don't know what's going to go off next. But we know this. God is in control. And that's why I said the greatest security meeting we'll ever have is that prayer meeting back there praying a hedge around this church. Amen? And I believe in that more than I believe in cameras or guards or guns. And I believe in all, all four of those. And we have them. And I ain't going to tell you who's got them. But I'll tell you this, we're ready. But we're going to be more ready. We're going to intensify. We're going to increase our cameras. We're going to do a lot of things. But I'm going to tell you this, is that uh, I'm glad a church member uh, took that maniac out before, before he killed everybody else in the church. He only killed three this, this morning, but he could have been 33. And so, you know, we live in a wicked day. And if you don't believe we're in a warfare, just, just as I said, I didn't know this was going on when I was preaching. 
as I said, just listen to the news, and you'll get alarmed at how wicked and dark the times are. So we're in warfare, and we need to uh, realize some things at the end of this year, and we need to look back, and there's three W's I want to give you. This is a very simple message uh, of how you can look back and take inventory. I used to work for General Electric Appliance Company, and that's where we had warehouse and warehouse. I worked my way through uh, college. Uh, soccer paid for some of it, but it didn't pay for all of it. And uh, we'd have to take inventory. I hated that with a passion because we had to go through the whole warehouse and count everything. You ever been in a department store where they had inventory? Isn't that the t most terrible thing? And we'd have to uh, count everything. I'll never forget... We had uh, clocks, little bitty clocks, and some of them were avocado color. I just said, what in the world is that? I think it was an ugly green. And uh, some of y'all used to have some like that. Gold. We'd have to list all that stuff, inventory. But inventory's necessary. And so we need to take inventory because, and I often wonder why we had to study history, because history will help us not make the same mistakes. So I want you to look back over your year. And I'm going to give you three simple points that Paul was looking back over his whole life. But I don't know if we can cover our whole life or not, but you can at least cover this last year and ask God if you've been faithful in these three areas. If you've been faithful in these three areas. You can't do everything, but you can be faithful. And there's three areas in the Christian life you must be faithful. You must be faithful. So let's study the Word of God, and I'll just give you a few minutes. Uh, 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1-8. through 8. Let's stand on the Word of God. And I do appreciate all of you that are interested. In a couple of weeks, man, we'll have a uh, very important security meeting. And we're going to redo some things and get some people uh, more involved. And I hope that we can have some uh, people here that are professional that will advise us a little bit. So we'll take every precaution. But the best thing we can do is pray for each other and pray for safety and hedge around this church. But there is a warfare. And that's what I'm going to preach on tonight. It says, I charge thee before, therefore before God... And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. One day we're going to give account of how we finished. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, and out of season. And today it seems like it's out of season to be faithful. It says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're there. But after their own lust shall they heap them to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, tickle my fancy. But look at verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch, thou in all things endure affliction to the work of evangelists. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered. He's about to die for the faith. And the time of my departure is at hand. And here's my text. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you uh, for the blessings of life. What a great song and a great reminder. And God, thank you for health and strength to be here today. I think about all those uh, sermons. Uh, Lord, over 6,500 I preached here and, and all those Sunday school lessons for 23 years that I taught. And God, it's only the grace of God. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but God, it's been a good run. It's been a good ministry. And Lord, I just want to finish right. I just want to finish right. I pray, dear God, that I wouldn't be a casualty like a lot of my preacher friends are. I saw one in the restaurant today. His wife has left him. His children has left him. And Lord, he's just so sad and so depressed. God, please bless that preacher and help him to get things right with God and his family. And Lord, I thank you, Brother Stringer. 66 years married. Many, many years up at North Whitfield Baptist Church preaching the gospel as they'll be burying him Tuesday. God, thank you for a faithful pastor up in Tunnel Hill. And God, I thank you for faithful deacons and I thank you for faithful teachers and God, faithful laymen. 
And, and thank you for our faithful ladies in this church. So God help us to finish right, because if we don't finish right, it'll all be wrong, and it'll all be upset, and we'll all, uh, Lord, be so regretful at the judgment seat of Christ. And so, Lord, help us as we study your word, help us be doctrinally sound, help us, God, to be ready to be, to, uh, be good soldiers, good, good soldiers for your glory. Well, thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I look back at Paul's life, and the first thing he speaks about is warfare. Look at it. I have fought a good fight. I have fought a good fight. Folks, the word fought uh, or fight in the Greek means agony. And it's a picture of literally a wrestling match. And I, and I used to have gym and I'd have wrestling matches and I hated them because I was the smallest, skinniest, well that was a long time ago, uh, skinniest person in the whole gym class. And one time the coach, he wanted to be smart Alex. His name's Coach Knight. I'll never forgive him. I'm bitter to this day about it. Uh, he said he's going to put me against the biggest guy in the whole school. And his name was Wayne Warehouse. No, it wasn't Warehouse. It was some high tower house or something. I don't know what it was. But he was huge. He was big as an elephant. He was, he was huge. And I was skinny. And I remember he, he, he pinned me. And then he sat on me. And I hate wrestling. It was agony. And they all made fun of it. But um, uh, it's agony. It's agony. The battle is agony. I want you to see, first of all, the entrance to the warfare. When do you get in this warfare? Well, the Bible says that you're born again and you you're become a new creature in Christ and immediately you become a warrior. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, young Christian preacher, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might war a good warfare. It didn't say be a good soldier. You can be a weekend warrior, you can be a good soldier, and not ever see war. Some of y'all were good soldiers, never saw war, and thank God you didn't. But I want to tell you something, friend. We are not just soldiers. We're warriors. Because there is a raging, agonizing fight going on. Ephesians 2, 1 says we're dead in our sins and trespasses. The moment we get born again, uh, we become part of the body of Christ. And folks, I want to tell them, the devil don't like it. You want, to, you want to make the devil mad, just get saved. But when you get saved, you're on the winning side. But there is a side. See, the average Christian thinks if they get saved, all their trouble is over. All their agony is over. All their wrestling matches is over. It's just going to be downhill and let's go to heaven and most people get saved because they want a ticket to heaven. And that's not bad because you sure don't want to go to hell. But folks, the problem with this lies threefold. There's three enemies. Number one, the old man does not die. Say amen right there. You, you believe the uh, old man dies, just turn to Romans chapter 7 and uh, the last few verses. Romans chapter 7. Turn there real quick. Please help me out now. Pray for me as I preach. A couple of amens won't hurt. And uh, please stay alert. Amen. This is a very urgent message I have on my heart. Almost turned it over, Brother Adam. But uh, God's burning this message in my heart for the last message of 2019. Look at it. Romans chapter 7. Preach the message one time, get out of Romans 7, get in Romans 8. And you'll see why. Look at verse uh, uh, 15. It says, So that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Does that sound like you sometimes? You don't want to sin, but you end up sinning. Then it says, And so then I do that which I would not. I consent to the law that is, that is, that is good. How? then is it no more I that do it, that sin that dwelleth in me. And look at this. He says, For I knew that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil, we're in verse 19. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And I find then a law, 
that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now listen to this agony. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of the sin. And then he says, There is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, which walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Sometimes we get these chapter headings and we stop the thought. He said, There is therefore. And folks, we're in a warfare. We're in a warfare of flesh versus spirit. If you give in to the flesh, you'll lose. If you give in to the flesh, you'll succumb to some terrible things. Some of you will shock yourself at what you could do in the flesh. And it doesn't mean you're not saved. It means that you are still in the flesh and there's a warfare. So number one, we got the flesh. The old nature still desires the old ways of living. The old habits, the old flesh, popularity. But then we have the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he's a roaring lion seeking to devour. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that he's a deceiver, the angel of light. Folks, he's a destroyer, but he's a deceiver. And folks, he's a discourager. Say amen right there. Have you ever been discouraged this past year? Take inventory. Say, I don't know of a week I haven't been discouraged. Well, God doesn't want you to live under the circumstances. God wants you to live under Christ. But there's the flesh. And then there's the devil. And then there's the world. And folks, the world's antichrist. And the world is anti you living for God. And folks, we need to realize that there is an enemy. And folks, that enemy is in the warfare. And we need to never, never drop our guard. I'll tell you the problem in the Christian life, real quick. See, most people have got their tunic over their head. That's a robe. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we ought to gird up our loins with truth. What's the truth? Well, Jesus is the truth. What's the truth? God's Word's the truth. But I'll tell you, I think another tr truth in context here is we're in a battle. We're in a battle. And I will say this, if you could see the invisible war that you're in as a Christian, you'd crawl here Tuesday night. Now, if you could just see a glimpse of the warfare, just see a glimpse. I'm not talking about the glimpse of the sniper. I'm not talking about the glimpse of some man that could that kill us. I'm talking about an enemy that's far more wise and far more subtle and far more deadly. And that's the devil. If you could see the invisible warfare, if you can see the imps of hell and the demons that are going to try to trip you up tomorrow and drag you back into flesh, you would fall on your knees right now before the invitation and say, oh God help me. But we don't see it. We don't feel it. We don't sense it. We just look at that guy's our enemy. And that person's our enemy. And that person hurt us. And I'm sure that's where we ought to forgive. And that's where we ought to realize that when Peter started sinning, Jesus identified who was, who was the problem. Get behind me, Satan. Amen? And so there's a warfare, and the enemy is Satan. And folks, we're engaged. And folks, we need to realize the angel of light is trying to deceive us into realizing, or not realizing, there is an enemy. But thank God there is an energy in this warfare. And that energy is this. He said, I have fought a good fight. Now, folks, there wasn't a prideful bone in Paul's body because it had all been beaten out of him. Say amen. He was a prideful Pharisee, and he killed a lot of Christians for being Christians. But I want to tell you something. When he got saved, God knew how to humble him. And three times he prayed for that thorn to be out of his flesh, and it did not. He said, no, no, no. And I want to tell you something, friend. He, when he said, I have fought a good fight, he wasn't talking about his ability. He was talking about his availability, and that God had fought through it. Look at Galatians 2.20, what he wrote to the Galatian church. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20.
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And what's after Colossians? 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy. Titus, Hebrews. All the uh, Bible chapters and books in, that start with a T are in alphabetical order. That'll help you find it. And you're probably still looking for it. But anyway, Galatians, Galatians. Chapter 2, verse 20. One of, my, one of the greatest verses in the Bible for uh, victory. And I believe, folks, for total identity and to help you realize who's fighting the battle and who can win the battle and the warfare. It says, for I am crucified with Christ. Folks, you were, you were literally there when Jesus was on the cross. And then he goes on to say, nevertheless, I live. I have fought a good fight. Now he said, no, nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ liveth in me. Isn't that wonderful? And in the life which I now live in the flesh, listen to this, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to tell you what's so great about the Christian life. You do not have to fight the battle on your own. And you don't have to outwit him. You don't have to outsmart him. You don't have to outdure, endure him. Uh, you don't have to do anything but yield to God and let God take the battle. When he knocks on the door, you ought to say, God, I can't handle that. Would you please answer the door? When the flesh reeks with your way, with your lust, with the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, say, Lord, I can't handle it. Would you please answer the door? And when the devil is greeted by the Holy Ghost and God the Father and God the Son, he scrams. He's out of here. Amen? Ephesians 6, verse 10. We'll refer a lot to Ephesians. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The power of His might. Aren't you glad greater is He that is in you than is He in the world? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He's talking to the Philippians now. And folks, when he said, I have fought a good fight, he's not taking credit for it. He's saying, I've yielded. And I'm not much, but God is everything, and he sure can whip the devil. I don't know why we don't let the Lord fight our battles, because he's never lost one. He's never lost one. Well, let him fight the battles. When we lose, it's because we lose. When we give in to the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes, it's our fault. It's not the devil's fault. It's not the world's fault. It's not the person tempting you. You gave in. Amen? And so folks, listen. We're, our, our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Next time you want to light up a stogie, you ought to think about that. Amen? Next time you want to go drink something, you ought to go think about that. Next time you want to have sex with somebody besides your wife, you ought to think about that. Because I'm going to tell you something, friend. The flesh is weak. And it's wilting and it's wretched. And folks, we cannot conquer the flesh on our own or Paul would have never wrote that, oh, wretched man that I am. Amen. Praise God, he got in Romans 7, got in Romans 8, says, but the Spirit, but the Spirit, but the Spirit, but the Spirit. The Spirit of Christmas is the Holy Spirit. You want to have joy and giving and all the stuff you've had in the last few days that's already gone? So y'all couldn't wait to get the tree out the door. Couldn't wait to get rid of Bethlehem, Judea, and uh, the wise men. You just packing them up, praise God. I did the same thing yesterday morning. Said, Hallelujah, praise God. We're going to get back to normalcy. I don't want to get back to normal. I'd like to have the spirit of Christmas all year round. Because the spirit of Christmas is the Holy Spirit. Number two, he speaks of a war, but he speaks of a walk. Let's go back to our text real quick. A walk. 2 Timothy 4, 6 says, I'm now ready to be offered. He's preaching this on his deathbed. He's looking out the window at the chopping block that he's about to lose his head. And uh, he's preaching this to young Timothy, and he said this, My departure's at hand. I have fought a good fight, but here it is. I finished my course. I finished my course. I love this course because it's the will of God. But the word course really means a marathon race. It means a long endurance. Folks, we're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. We don't win the battle overnight. It's every day. Day by day, we find our course. We stay in the course. We yield to the course. 
I want to tell you what's so dangerous about starting getting slack on church attendance. I want to tell you what's dangerous. Think of these Bible guys. What's dangerous? Skipping one day of Bible reading. It becomes a habit of skipping one day of Bible reading. It becomes a habit of not coming to church. It becomes a habit of not praying. And folks, I want to tell you something. It takes 18 days to engrave a habit in your heart. But it takes just one or two times for you to say, oh, no, that's not important. And you stay at home when you ought to be here. And folks, you uh, don't make it. You're not as faithful to this place as you are your job. And folks, this is more important than your job. It's more important than you making a buck. It's more important than you having a career. Because I want to tell you something. You can have all the money in the world and all the careers and all the things in the world and lose your family. What does it profit? And lose your testimony. What does it profit? And so folks, there's a course. And that course is day by day. And I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Just a few doors over. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And this is the theme for this coming year. That we ought to have a greater vision in 2020. I wanted to say you have 2020 vision, but I want more than 2020 vision. I want to have supernatural vision of the Lord and the lost. Amen. Of the Lord and the lost. And when you get a focus on Jesus, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says you become like him. That ought to be our goal for 2020. We ought to keep our eyes and focus on Jesus. And the more we look into the perfect law of liberty, and the more we look into the Word of God, and the more we look to Jesus, the more we'll be like him. And folks, you will never be satisfied until you're like Him. And so we ought to have that process every day being more like Jesus. Every day glorifying God through His likeness. Amen? That's the deep meaning of the Christian life. But I want you to see Hebrews 12. Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now folks, I hate to disagree with a lot of people. They think that's heaven. I think heaven's got a lot more to do than just look at our lives. They're worshiping the Lord. Now, I know we'll know each other. Somebody asked D.L. Moody, he said, you think we'll know each other in heaven? And he looked at them and said, don't you think we'll have more sense up there than we do down here? Of course we'll know each other. Amen. Some people said, will, you have, will there be dogs up there? Will there be cats up there? I'm not going to answer that question because all you dog lovers and cat lovers will never come back. I don't believe they have a soul. I, don't believe, I, don't, I believe they can be trained, but I don't believe they have a soul. Amen. Your parakeet's not going to heaven with you. He might have a mouth, but he ain't, he ain't got a soul. Amen. Uh, we shot two possums, three possums in the last few weeks. I don't know what's wrong with this possum. They ain't got a soul. Jason didn't want to kill him. I said, shoot them. Shoot them right, hit, hit right through the head. Amen. Praise God. And I, I, I said, but they're captive. I said, well, let him run and shoot them. Amen. But shoot the thing. It ain't good for nothing. I almost gave it to Brother Donald. I thought he might could cook it up for the next social, but I didn't. I didn't think everything would be good, possum stew. Hey, we've got to have that for New Year's. Amen. But let's stop meddling. It says, wherefore, <laughs> seeing you preach as many times as I do, you're going to get off track a few times. So just, just forgive me, okay? Wherefore, preach against possums. God help me. There, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. I believe that's those people of faith. Wherefore means, notice what's before. The whole chapter is on people that by faith. They went on to heaven, yes. But you've got to consider how faithful they were. And folks, the last few verses of Hebrews chapter 11, they didn't come out too good. They were sawed asunder. And, um, my word, they, were, they had the violence, the edge of the sword, and uh, they waxed valid in the fight. They turned their flight to the armies to aliens, and they received their dead raised again. And they had cruel mockings and scourging. Uh, I'm glad Oral Roberts didn't read this chapter before he made that famous saying, something good's going to happen to you today. Something bad might happen to you. But praise God, something good's going to happen to you while it's going bad because all things work together for the good of them. To love God, and God will never fail you. God will never fail you. So compass about with so great a cloud of witnesses, wherefore, that's referring back to Hebrews 11. And then look at this. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now I've heard this preach. The sin that so easily besets you is that sin that's, that's, um, that you have weakness. Maybe it's the sin of pornography. It just, just upsets you. By the way, it will because it's addictive. Or maybe it's that sin of cussing. You just can't get over it. Maybe it's the sin of drinking. 
so you won't be here Tuesday night because you want to get drunk. Uh, what I say is get saved and come on in. Amen? But uh, listen, listen to me. That sin is the sin of unbelief. Listen to this. And he says, the sin that so easily besets us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Folks, we must have faith in God. Amen. We must have faith in God. The just shall live by faith, but faith is the victory that overcometh the world. Faith in whom? God. Because look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Folks, well, there's a lot of people fainting. I mean, passing out. Never forget the time I had a What do you call it? Physical. That's what it was, a physical. I hadn't had a physical before. I was only 18. My mother didn't take me to the doctor much. Surprised I didn't die as a kid. But anyway. And I was a physical to get a job. And I was lined up with all these uh, pretty young ladies behind me. And, and they were getting jobs as cashiers. I was going to be a stock clerk. And I uh, tried to work my way through college a little bit more from UPS. Making two, three seventy five an hour. I thought I was rich. And I remember I hadn't ate all day for some reason. Been busy. Stayed up all night studying. I'm going to say I did anyway. And they took my blood. The next thing I know, I'm on the ground in front of all those ladies I'm trying to impress. And I'm passed out. I woke up and they got, they got smelling sauce under my nose. And it was so embarrassing that I fainted in front of my fellow employees at Davison's department store. And I did, I, as soon as I woke up, I said, I hadn't eaten three days. I lied. I, didn't, I, I lied. It was three hours. Lied like a vulture on the floor. I, I hadn't eaten a long time. But, you know, it was the, it was, it, you know, I don't mind seeing other people's blood, but it was the first time I saw my blood, and I passed out, fainted. It's an awful feeling. You just lose control. And, folks, I want to tell you something. There's some Christians that are in this room that are fainting, spiritually fainting. The Bible says you ought to pray Lest ye, lest ye faint, pray, uh, pray without ceasing, lest ye faint. It was Luke 18, 1. Folks, we need to inhale uh, the promises of God and exhale praise. And we need to have a spiritual walk with God. The race is individual. It's not somebody else's race. It's your race. There's one person you ought to race for, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? You don't try to outrace other people. You don't compare yourself to other people. Folks, He's the only one that matters. Because He is the judge. We run for Him. We run for Him. We ought to wait on the Lord and mount up with wings as eagles and they shall run and not faint. Even the youth faint. But folks, we ought to be faithful. Our race is the will of God. It's a course. It's not a sprint. Paul referred to this Race is a marathon. I often wonder, what does the word marathon mean? Well, I looked it up, and, and the ancient, Paul was referring to an ancient marathon in the Greek games, 490 B.C. The Athenians won a, won a crucial and decisive uh, battle over the forces of King Darius I of Persia on the plain near the small Greek coast village of Marathon. Marathon. And one of the Greek soldiers ran nonstop from the battlefield to Athens to carry the news of victory, but he ran with such unreserved effort that he fell dead at the feet of those after he delivered the message. The marathon race is so popular today is named for that battlefield, but mostly for that soldier. He ran the race over 26 miles. And folks, we are to complete the marathon. I believe with all my heart there's no place to quit. I've tried to find some, Brother Randy. I've tried to excuse myself because everybody else quit. I got my eyes off Jesus. One of my best friends in this church walked out on me. We were so close, he willed his children to me. Mostly to Connie. I don't think anybody willed any children to me. And they, we were so close. 
He wants to go start a video game, a smut shop, have X-rated movies. I had to discipline him and say, you can no longer be a deacon in this church, and I am ashamed of you. And he resigned. Then he resigned the church. Broke my heart. I wanted to find a place to quit. I just wanted to find a place to quit. When Connie and I first got in the ministry, we'd only been in the ministry two years. And a man of God that I thought was a man of God and was my pastor, I believe with all my heart, he killed his wife. He had scratches on his face at the funeral. Brenda was Connie's best friend. Sweet, sweet lady. She fell accidentally in the shower, snapped her neck. Two months before that, the pastor was called in an affair with the secretary. Broke our hearts. I wanted to quit. Connie and I didn't eat for three days. We fasted, prayed in a little apartment. We was renting in a motel that they made an apartment out of. And I said, I don't want to quit. Brother Paul came on the scene. He said, you ain't quitting. You're going to stay here two years, whether you like it or not. He was tough. He was mean. He was rough. I told him one year after that, I said, I'm going to start a church in Dalton, Georgia. He said, you ain't mean enough. I said, you got to be mean to the pastor. He said, let me rephrase that. You ain't tough enough. You know something? I wouldn't. I'd have quit. But I want to tell you something. The next year as I trained under him and served under him and saw what he went through and his faith, it instilled in me to never quit. That My race was to, to finish what I started. And um, the fellowship and other people, they often make a big deal out of me being the uh, not the oldest preacher. I'm not the oldest but the one that's been in the same church the longest in our fellowship. And, um, and I think to myself, man, I'm a fickle person. I'm pretty emotional. I sometimes wear my feelings on my shoulder. Thank God I got a wife that does it. And I wanted to quit. I wanted to find a place to quit. But you know something? God told me to run the marathon and to be faithful to cross the line. And folks, God's called you to be that way. Sin will sideline you. Selfishness will sideline you. If you give in to the flesh, you're going to ruin your testimony. You're going to be disqualified and you'll be like a castaway, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I want to run the race and I don't want to be a castaway. That means put on the shelf. And folks, he mentions reward though. They didn't have a corruptible crown, but they had an incorruptible crown. Look at verse 8. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me of that day, and not only to me, but to all them that love his appearing. You know why you ought to finish your course? Because you love him. You know why you ought to finish your course? Because he finished his. He went all the way to Calvary. He didn't give up on you when you sinned. He helped you back. He forgave your sins. He saved your soul. We ought to look to Him as the author and the finisher of our course. I love the will of God, don't you? But I'll tell you what, self will knock you right off of it. Sin will knock you right out of it. The flesh will get you off course. You'll be up in the stands as a backslidden couch coach criticizing everything going on, looking for fault, and saying they ought to fire the guy. You're not even in the race. You're up in the stands, second-guessing the guy. Because of sin. Because of self. One more word. He speaks not only of the war, not only does he speak of the walk, but he speaks about the word. He said, I have kept the faith. One way that you keep the faith is you guard it. I thank God for Brother Jeremy's ministry, preaching and teaching on the King James Bible. I believe we ought to keep the faith. If men can die for the King James Bible, at least we can stand for it. Say amen. 
And it's not popular. Everybody wants a new version, and everybody wants a new worship, and everybody wants a new style, and everybody wants to have fun. But folks, I want to be faithful. We can have twice as many people, maybe three times, four times many people here tonight. If we just loosen up a little bit, people say that all the time. But I don't see any place where it says that we ought to compromise the Word. We're a spiritual Fort Knox. We need to guard the precious treasure of the Word. We shouldn't alter one, one sentence. We ought to be faithfully passing on to the next generation. Look at 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It says, And these things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We ought to commit it to others. We're not in this race by ourselves. We need to pass it on. Matter of fact, it's, it's not only a marathon. It's a, it's a relay race. We need to pass that baton to our children. Boy, I was thrilled to death at Christmas when Abby, my oldest granddaughter. No, she's not my oldest. Emily's my oldest. Y'all pray for her. She's, she's a senior. God, help her. And um, she's um, a teenager. God, help her. And she's in the middle of South Africa. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. But I need to pray for her every day. You do too. You need to pray for the children of our missionaries. They have a warfare going on. They have many decisions. We need to pray for the wives of our missionaries. All Jeremy and Kevin, but I want to tell you something. Without, um, oh, let me get this straight now. Rebecca and Corley, they're in trouble. And without Amy, Mark ain't got a chance. Say amen right there. He'll try to cover all of Africa in one year. And I'll say this, friend. We need to pass it on. How do you guard the Word? Treasure it enough to teach the next generation. And though, folks, he not only protected the message, but he protected the messenger. He says, I have kept the faith. You know what that means? Here's a man who reached the end of his journey and he still was clutching the message with his heart, not just his hand. He believed. A man does not die for a lie. A man dies for a risen Lord. And he saw him on the road to Damascus. Paul never fell out of love with Jesus. May I ask you to examine your year. How much of you love Jesus over yourself, the world, the flesh, the devil? We run for Him. We walk with Him. But folks, we walk by faith. This is a faith life. It's not based on feelings. You need to stay in the Word this year. I want you to look back. Did you read your Bible this year? Did you pray this year? Did you war this year? Was you victorious against the devil and the flesh? Listen to me now. You're not listening. Or did you give in and succumb to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life? Did you give in to what you wanted? Did you give in to the devil? Hey, did you give in to the world? Or did you keep the faith? Folks, the gospel is the only treasure that gets more valuable as we share it. Well, to keep the faith. But that don't mean just keep it to yourself. That means live it demonstrate it, walk it, talk it, and share it. Let me ask you a question about this past year. This is the epitaph of your year, 2019. Did you win somebody to the Lord? How many people have you influenced for Jesus? How many tracts did you actually hand out that you believed it was the Word of God? And that you handed that, that verse out with confidence and faith that that Word would never return void? How many doors have you knocked on? Some people will knock on doors for politicians and won't, they won't uh, knock on doors for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That ought not be. Folks, listen. There's a warfare. There's a walk. But praise God. There's a word that we ought to treasure. And we ought to take to the lost and dying world 
because it's their only hope. This year, I don't make resolutions. Last time I made a resolution, it lasted 18 days. I gave up margarine. And then my wife cooked one of those homemade pound cakes on the 18th of January. I'll never forget it when I went down the drain. And that homemade pound cake came off out of that oven. And I always say, can I, can I sample it? You know how we are. We smell it. We almost feel it. It's yellow and it's spongy and it's steaming hot. And we sliced it. And I sliced it. And I said, where is the margarine? And I started getting DTs saying, oh, I can't, I can't, I don't, no, 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 I can't, I can't do it. But soon I found the butter knife in my right hand, and I took that butter knife, and I smeared it all over, and it melted in my mouth. Broke my resolution. So I ain't making no resolution. But I want to make a recommitment. To, to be a faithful soldier. To be a faithful runner. And a faithful steward of God's Word. Aren't you glad you're saved? And aren't you glad you're on the winning side? And aren't you glad God's entrusted you with this book? That you could take it to a lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this challenge. That the, as we end this year, 2019, it's gone, it's over. A few days, a couple of days. We'll be praying out the old year and praying in the new. But God, don't make it an ordinary year. We don't want no ordinary. We want to be a miracle. We want to see something above average and we want to see something supernatural in our life take place. And God, we're not looking for some platform to be some fake healer or miracle worker. God, we just want you to get the glory. We want to run the race. When we take our last breath preach our last message that somebody might could say as they pass the casket, see the old bald-headed preacher laying in the casket. He was faithful. He was faithful to preach the word in season, out of season. He was faithful to walk the walk, and I just talk the talk. He was faithful to win souls. He was faithful to stay in the will of God. It's a prayer for each person in here each daddy, each mother, God, each uh, teenager, that Christ could be seen in our life in 2020. And God, that we could have a fresh vision of you every day through your word and prayer. And God, thus we could see souls and see this world as you see it. Oh God, that's our prayer. We'd see souls like you see them. God, give us a greater vision for 2020 is our prayer. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me say, preacher, I'm not even saved, but I'm concerned about my soul enough to say I need to be saved. And I want to be on the winning side in this warfare. I don't want to succumb to the devil, the world, the flesh. I, I don't want to just live for myself. Oh my. That's a trap of bondage when you live for the world and the Satan and self. But I want to be saved. And I'm not saved. Never been saved. Want to be saved. And you'd say, preacher, please pray for me in your closing prayer. I'm not saved, but I'd like to be. Change the invitation a little bit so listen closely. I'm not saved, but I'd like to be. I want you to pray for me. Nobody's looking. You'd say, preacher, please pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Would you slip your hand up real high for prayer and then back down to anyone? Real quick. I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Just slip your hand up. God bless you, ma'am. Appreciate the way you listen. Anybody else? Just slip your hand up and say, preacher, I'm not even on the winning side. I don't have the spirit to fight my battles. I don't have the spirit of God to win other people, Lord. I've got little ones looking up to me and I can't lead them to heaven. I can't, I can't because I'm without Christ. Pray for me. Two's raise their hand. How about you? I see that hand. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. God bless you. Be a great way to end 2019 by being getting getting saved. We can have somebody take the Bible on this front row during the invitation and show you how you can go to heaven. 
have victory, have a walk that's worthwhile, the will of God, and have faith, have faith in God. And everybody else will know you have faith in God. Lead others to Jesus. Have me say, preacher, I'm saved, but I need to, I need, I need to, I need to be a more faithful soldier. By the way, by the way, the war is intensifying. You know why? The devil knows his time's running out. The rapture's about to take place. Can somebody say amen? And he's intensifying his effort. He's using things that he's never used before, like shootings in a church. God, help us. God, help us. He's using preachers falling into sin. He's using a lot of discouraged Christians falling out of church. So how many of you say, preacher, I need to be a better soldier. I need to finish my course. I need to keep the faith. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up high for prayer all over this place? All over this place. Thank you for listening tonight. Father, thank you for the message. Very simple message. One verse, really. God, we want to be faithful in the warfare. We want to be faithful in our walk. We definitely want to be faithful to and through the Word of God and your Spirit. God, thank you. As Paul was about to die for the faith, that he left this word for Timothy, and Timothy passed it on to us. And the Holy Ghost passed it on to us, better said. So Lord, bless in the invitation. Pray for these who raise their hand that they'd come and shake my hand during the first verse of the invitation. Their lady will have a lady take the Bible and show them how to be saved at this front pew. Their man will have a man take the Bible and show them how to be saved. We'll praise you for eternity for these getting saved. And God, I pray that some Christians will walk this aisle so they can walk the aisles of life in the coming year and be faithful to praise your name and glorify your name. We'll thank you in Jesus' name.